Beyond being a critical and commercial success, and even receiving an Oscar nomination for its groundbreaking visual effects, The Mask is an incredibly dense movie, jam-packed with visual gags and easter eggs that can prove rewarding to spot on repeat viewings. And yet, you almost certainly missed most of them every single time. So, let's take a look at them, shall we? I'm Ewan, this is War Culture, and here are 20 things you somehow missed in The Mask. Number 20. The most iconic look only appears for five minutes. When you think of the mask, chances are you think of Jim Carrey in that iconic yellow suit. However, what you may not notice when watching the film is that that particular suit only shows up for about five minutes of screen time. Yet, the iconic yellow threads that were plastered all over the movie's marketing and are arguably the definitive mask look, they barely make up a fraction of the running time. Kind of a testament to how striking they are that we all probably assume otherwise. Number 19. Jim Carrey's Makeup Mistake Shortly after Stanley first puts on the mask, he heads outside and is accosted by a gang of criminals, whose leader asks him the time. In response, the mask pulls out a large pocket watch, but if you keep your eyes on the left-hand side of the screen, you might spot a telling makeup mistake. As the mask is rattling through his shtick, namely telling the ringleader that he's going to pull his underwear over his head, a flesh-coloured flap of rubber is visible at the back of the mask. While the flap should have been blended into Jim Carrey's natural skin tone with makeup, evidently it got missed here. When the camera shot changes though, the flap can thankfully no longer be seen, and I promise for the remainder of the video, there's going to be no more discussion about flaps. Number 18. Stanley's Visible Skeleton Let's jump back a few moments earlier now to when Stanley first puts on the mask in his apartment. As he spins around and begins his transformation into the mask, there's a sneaky treat hidden for those who manage to smash the pause button just as a lightning strike flashes into the room. If you can freeze frame at just the right moment, you'll see a comically cartoonish x-ray of Stanley's skeleton. Because in a film that's basically a live-action cartoon all the best ways, why the hell not? It's incredibly difficult to spot the skeleton in conventional motion, so props to the VFX artist for even bothering at all. Especially in an era years before crystal clear home video, freeze frames were really a thing. Number 17. The Garage is the Ghostbusters Firehouse while the film's more memorable subplots involve Stanley being pushed around and ripped off by a pair of shady auto mechanics. But if you pay close attention to their shot where Stanley first enters it, it might look a little bit familiar. Why, indeed, that's the same firehouse from Ghostbusters, which also happens to be a real form of fire station situated in downtown LA called Fire Station Number 23. Its prominent use in Ghostbusters made it a popular shooting location for many major movies afterwards throughout the rest of the 1980s and 1990s, including not only The Mask, but also Police Academy 2, Flatliners, and National Security, among many others. Number 16. Peggy's Foreshadowed Dishonesty while the mask's more intriguing and unexpected subversions involve seemingly idealistic, determined reporter Peggy Brandt ultimately selling Stanley out to gangster Dorian Tyrell for her own material gain. Yet, there's an incredibly subtle hint much earlier in the movie that Peggy shouldn't be taken at face value and is actually an inherently dishonest, untrustworthy person. You see, when we first meet Peggy, as she reports from the aftermath of the Masks auto shop rampage, she tells Lieutenant Calloway that she's from the Evening Star newspaper. But when she introduces herself to Stanley mere minutes later, she says she's from the Tribune. While it's possible Peggy works for both newspapers in a freelancing capacity, and honestly get that back, this is more likely supposed to tip keen-eared viewers off that something isn't quite right with her. Number 15. The Bedside Peanut Butter Here's a really interesting one. At the end of the first act of The Mask, Stanley memorably has a sexy dream where Tina, Cameron Diaz, approaches him and starts licking his face, before of course he wakes up to realise it was actually his adorable dog Milo. 
If you peer to the left-hand side of the screen, though, you'll see a jar of peanut butter on Stanley's bedside table with a knife sticking out of it. No, this isn't Stanley having a mere indulgent midnight snack. It's actually an old Hollywood trick employed by dog handlers on film sets to help canines do as directed. It's reasonable to assume that Jim Carrey had some peanut butter smothered on his face for the dog to lick off, and a member of the crew evidently just forgot to move the jar out of frame. Number 14. The Musical Foreshadowing some clever foreshadowing now, but something only the opera lovers among us are likely to catch. When Stanley first enters the auto shop to deal with his car, the operatic song that can be heard playing on the radio is Vesti La Giuba, a piece from Ruggiero Leon Cavallo's 1892 opera Pagliacci. More to the point, the track translates in English to put on the costume, nodding to the fact that this is one of the incidents which ultimately pushes Stanley to become the mask. Indeed, he not only puts on the costume, but returns here to deal with the bent mechanics later on and give them their just desserts. Number 13. The Used Condom Gag Here's a gag that seems obvious in retrospect, and yet it's incredibly easily missed while you're watching. When the mask messes with his gangster assailants by taking the guise of a circus balloon artist, at one point he pulls out a quote-unquote balloon that's actually a used, or at least unrolled, condom before quipping, sorry, wrong pocket, and tossing it away. Now, if you watch the mask in your youth, you likely remember assuming that this was just a dud balloon or something. Whereas when revisiting the film as an adult, it's easier to appreciate what they were actually going for. Apparently, the risque joke was suggested by Carey himself, and proves just sly enough that it managed to skate past both kids and the MPAA. Number 12. Ripley's Ripoff After the mask deals some excessive revenge to the crooked mechanics by shoving two car exhausts where the sun doesn't shine, we catch a brief glimpse of the outside of their shop as they're wheeled out by the paramedics. Take a look at the sign above the shop, though, which you might notice has been crudely defaced by the mask. While it originally said Ripley's Auto Finishing, the sign now reads Rip Off. Number 11. The Pocket Gag Mistake Roughly an hour into the movie, when the mask is accosted by the police at a park, there's a hilarious gag where Detective Doyle and another cop are searching through the mask's seemingly impossibly deep pockets and pulling everything out. And not to be that guy or anything, but there's a glaring continuity mistake here. The scene's establishing shot actually shows the various items that Doyle and the cop pull out afterwards, such as a rubber chicken, novelty sunglasses, bowling pin, and so on. In the very next shot, we actually see these objects being pulled from the mask's pockets, no matter that they're actually already on the floor. If you want to be generous, you could suggest that the mask has duplicates in his pockets, but this is as clear an editing mistake as they come. Not that anyone should really care, but still, funny to notice all the same. Number 10. The Blatant Prop Money the morning after the mask's chaotic appearance at the Coco Bongo nightclub, Helloway shows up at Stanley's front door, suspecting him to be the mask after finding a piece of his pajamas at the scene. As Kellaway knocks, Stanley is sent into a panic as he realizes that the money he stole from the bank as the mask is hidden in a closet in his apartment. As Stanley desperately tries to shove the money back into the closet, several times throughout the scene, we can see that some of the banknotes in question are one-sided and merely blank on the other side. This of course confirms that they're just prop items and not real money. That's not terribly surprising, but the same? Was it really too much ever to just print on both sides of the paper? Number 9. Cameron Diaz's Dubbed Singing Voice Jim Carrey and Cameron Diaz both get the opportunity to sing throughout the mask, though in Diaz's case, her singing received some major post-production assistance. That is to say, when we hear Tina singing G-Baby, Ain't I Good To You at the Coco Bongo, that isn't Diaz's voice. Rather, Diaz is miming to an actual rendition performed by Susan Boyd. Still, the vocal likeness to Diaz's own voice is true enough that nobody could be blamed for believing she did all the crooning herself. If you assume the same was true of Carrie, though, well, not quite. His brief musical interludes were all him, though those wild outbursts were probably a little more forgiving on an untrained singing voice compared to Diaz's seductive lounge act. Number 8. All the Looney Tunes References 
Hell yeah, now we're talking. It's rather fitting that a film so cartoonish and indebted to cartoons as a medium contains some very pointed nods to the Looney Tunes. For starters, when Stanley first becomes the mask, he performs a tornado spin in his apartment that's incredibly similar to the Tasmanian Devils. And to hammer the point home even more, there's even a Taz cushion on Stanley's couch. Oh, sorry, I just... I love Looney Tunes stuff. We need a Merry Melodies resurgence or something. Elsewhere, his efforts to romance Tina in the park are inspired by Pepe Le Pew. His faux death speech references a Bugs Bunny short, and when his tongue rolls out of his mouth while watching Tina perform, he's nodding towards Tex Avery's iconic wolf. Number seven, the dancing body doubles. Though Jim Carrey and Cameron Diaz did a lot of their own dancing for the iconic Hey Pachuco dance scene at the Coco Bongo, it's not exactly a surprise that some of the more complex and dangerous moves were performed by more skilled doubles even if only for insurance reasons. And while the scene mostly cuts seamlessly between the actors and their doubles, there are a few shots where it's possible to spot that we're not actually watching Kerry and Diaz at all. Diaz's double in particular, not lucky enough to be wearing a features disguising mask, can clearly be seen wearing a ratty blonde wig in a few shots. And more to the point, her arms are way more toned than Diaz's. Number six, that Ren and Stimpy nod. Looney Tunes isn't the only cartoon franchise given a wink and a nod during the movie, as when Stanley enlists Milo to help him escape from the police station, for a few fractions of a second, we can see the Ren and Stimpy show playing on the station's desk. Fittingly, the episode in question, the series pilot, Big House Blues, shows Stimpy himself locked up in a cell, mirroring Stanley's own predicament. Though, given that this shot is also featured in the animated series opening credits, and we only see Stimpy for a few frames, the production could have used any episode for the Easter egg. Number 5. The Freddy Krueger Callback a more adult skewing easter egg now, and one clearly close to the heart of director Chuck Russell. After Dorian puts on the mask for the first time and transforms, he says, what a rush. While wrestling fans might assume this was a cheeky nod to WWE tag team The Legion of Doom and their identical catchphrase, its origins actually date back years before to a classic horror sequel, A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. A movie I only saw for the first time last year, by the way, and wow, probably my favorite Elm Street movie? Robert Englund's Freddy Krueger birthed the one-liner while killing Taron in the movie, and if you're still not convinced that the mask was directly nodding to that movie, it was also directed by none other than Russell himself. Number 4. You can hear the mask handcuff Mitch and Doyle. When the cops confront the mask at the park, he manages to flee the scene after surreptitiously handcuffing Calloway and Doyle together, much to their annoyance. It's supposed to be as much a surprise to the audience as the two detectives, but if you listen closely, it's actually teed up a few seconds before the big on-screen reveal. While the mask is making a crack about Calloway's wife, who he has a framed picture of in his endless pockets, the faint sound of a pair of handcuffs being cuffed can be heard. Yet, unless you're listening on a really good sound system or a decent pair of headphones, it's pretty tough to spot. Number 3. The Countdown to the End of the Movie In the film's climax, a mask-wearing Dorian plans to blow up the Coco Bongo with a timed bomb, and if the bomb's LED readout doesn't make the 10-minute time limit clear enough, Dorian even says out loud, this party's over in 10 minutes. The mask certainly doesn't have that timer play out in real time within the context of the story, but it instead serves as a countdown to the end of the movie. Indeed, from the moment that Dorian activates the timer, it's almost exactly 10 minutes before the end credits roll. It's actually around 10 minutes and 15 seconds, but still close enough for this to be an inspired meta wink wink gag. Number 2. The Poorly Directed Extras Directing visual effects-driven sequences is incredibly difficult, and this only gets more challenging when such scenes involve extras who likely aren't privy to the technical particulars of filmmaking and, well, acting. 
And this is made evident during the Coco Bongo dance sequence between Tina and the mask. But when the mask gives Tina a cartoonish tornado spin, if you watch the club's patrons, they don't seem particularly shocked that they're seeing the laws of physics being defied before their very eyes. It's reasonable to assume that either director Russell or an assistant director didn't give the extras sufficient direction to be wild and amazed at what they were seeing. And so their reactions end up feeling like a colossal undersell. And number one, the visible dog trainer. And to wrap things up, we've got another dog trainer mistake for you. During the film's climax, Milo grabs the mask and one of Dorian's henchmen, Sweet Eddie, chases after him. Despite grabbing Milo's legs, he's unable to stop Milo from putting the mask on. Yet, we never actually see actor Forrest and Milo in the same shot throughout the scene, with a pair of hands presumably belonging to the dog trainer performing all the actual interactions with the dog. This is hammered home by a brief, bizarre shot where we can see a man who definitely isn't Forrest grabbing Milo's legs. It makes sense that they're the dog trainer, but what doesn't make sense is why their face wasn't cropped out of the shot. Then again, basically nobody noticed this, so I guess we can say the shot served its purpose. 